Hello everybody, this is Wen Lawson. I'm an autistic adult, uh, husband. Um, we have autistic grown up children. It's weird thinking of children as being grown up uh, offspring. And they have between them three autistic, we have three autistic granddaughters from our uh, young people. Um, the point of our, this discussion and forgive me, we've had a few goes at this, so I'm I'm trying not to to worry about that. So this is entitled "Gender Identity in Autism," and it's to give a personal and research perspective. Just so you know, these photos on the screen in front of us. Um, there's on your far left. There's myself with my two sisters, and um, although I was assigned female at birth. I never felt very much at home in that gender. Um, didn't know it for a very long time. I, you don't know your home if you're not home, if you know what I mean, till you get there. So you'll see me dressed in pants and I was very, very frequently dressed like that as a young person. And as an autistic person, who's also ADHD, dyslexic, dyspraxic, and auditory processing issues, just to make sure you know that that's where I'm coming from. Um, I did, also didn't like the feel of dresses on the back of my legs. So I, I, I felt that need for a continuity in clothing. So I either wore very short things or very long things, uh, nothing in between. And when I was forced to, that was very uncomfortable and not at all a happy when. You can see me um, on the right of your screen, just about with Temple in my female form when I was doing some a lecturing tour with Temple Grandin, who's another autistic adult in the States. And we've written together and spoken together on a number of occasions. In the middle of the screen, that small picture there, you can see myself with our four offspring. Beatrice, who is my wife, is standing next to me and she was just 20 years old then and I'd only known her about six weeks. She didn't speak any English at that point either. Um, that didn't take her long to pick up to. As an autistic person, She's pretty quick to learn things like languages. Down on the left-hand corner beneath the one of the three of us at the top is my brother. He was nine when I was born. And um, when I told him that he actually has a brother and not a sister, he was wrapped. He was real pleased and very welcoming, which was a relief. Um, you can see Beatrice and I with our two grandchildren, two of them who are now taller than me. So that was quite a while ago. You can see me with uh, the magpie feeding and the magpies come to our porch most days and uh, when they've got offspring they come as well and you can probably just about make out Queenie the tortoiseshell pussycat who's sleeping on the black chair in um, behind us there she has grown up she actually thinks she's a magpie I, I believe I've not been able to check that with her because there of our communication differences but she loves to feed with the magpies and is very very unhappy to go outside to eat her breakfast or dinner. If they're not there, it's almost like you're supposed to make them arrive. And um, I tell her it's not that simple, but she's very unhappy with me. She loves to share socially with the magpies. So we're all very, very different. We're all different people. We have different histories. And um, I'm sure you watching have very different histories too. So I want to talk about gender per se, as in gender meaning male, female, and lots of things in between as well as a particular focus on gender variance and gender dysphoria. Um, this is something that is uh, becoming more and more and more um, noticed in the world of, of, um, of autism. Here we go. This one has a picture there and in the center across the middle, the word says connection. And that's one thing that I found really interesting as autistic people, whose minds are, I say wired, we don't have any wires in our brains, it's just a metaphor for means the way our brain connects to various parts of itself, the way it sends messages across and between those parts um, is very different to what we see in the non-autistic population. We call them um, sometimes neurotypical, that's a term that's been used. More recently, we talk about owlistic, Allistic meaning together, autistic meaning apart or separate from. 
Um, and so there's less stigma around those terms. And it's not one is better than the other. That just is not so. They're just very, very different. But if the connection process is happening in autistic brains, quite single file, one, one kind of thing at a time, we're much more likely to connect to details about something, um, especially details we're interested in, not so likely to connect to the bigger picture. Now that has lots of pluses for our strengths and our passions that we're working with, but it can be, it can have a downside um, when we're relating socially, where we need a concept and an understanding of the bigger picture. And in autism, concepts are often incomplete. People talk about going out, they're very rarely saying they come back in, or they talk about what they're going to to um, to have for their dinner or some other thing they talk about, but they don't finish the sentence, talk about what happens after or what that could mean. So we often as autistic people have incomplete concepts and it's very important that people understand this actually. Um, Self-discovery is a process of connection. The family, country, culture, personality, and our learning style, um, what we are, what we arrive with is not a choice. They're kind of chosen before we have any say in it. But what we do with those things, who we share ourselves with, um, what we share about ourselves, those are our choices. And it's important to know we have that autonomy. We certainly do not have to tell the world everything that's happening for us. Although for me, that's a difficult thing because I don't, I'm not so good at filtering things about what you say and don't say. That's that incomplete concept process for me and my personality, which is very outgoing and very social. So all of those things, those sorts of connections do presume a connection, an understanding, a big picture understanding about self and other. And that takes time in autism. It's not an easy process to, um, to engage with or to get a, a, some kind of completion from. So even when we think of the female gender, in autism, you know, and it's not just in autism, but in, in being human, um, we're all very, very different. You've got girly girls, you've got tomboy girls, and all of those in between. Um, it's quite a, a, a spectrum, that gender, and it's the same for the male gender. Very rough tumble, perhaps uh, footy kind of guys, two guys who, um, who are not sports people. Um, who might be more inclined to reading, for example. And, and it's, they're all just as male, but they present differently. And unfortunately, our stereotypical understanding of gender has meant that certain aspects of who we are have been overlooked, prejudged, um, people haven't been sensitive to, et cetera. And it's, it's very interesting, some of the research that's showing lots of this kind of thing in autism. Who am I? Well, I love to write poetry. I actually find writing something down and then reflecting back on it very helpful to making sense of my world. So this is a poem that I'd written uh, about gender. Who am I? A little girl dressed in pink, a little boy in blue. The object here is clear, you see. They offer the gender clue. The picture of what's right the picture of what's wrong. We see it every day, we see it every way, we hear it in a song. But whose song do we sing? Who do we represent? All of humanity or just the ones we get? What's the guiding rule here? What's the thing to do? The rule is, the rule is it's different. It's different for me and it's different for you. When our kids were born, um, I had three sons and a daughter. Um, we didn't dress them in pink or blue to help people understand their, whether they were boys or girls. We tended to dress them in yellow, purple, deep blues, um, green, simply because of my love for colour. Um, and because all of my kids were bored, that means they didn't have any hair, uh, a bit like me really, but <laughs> I've got some hair still, uh, not a lot on top. So it was harder for people to even recognize the baby as a boy or a girl. 
So we used to say the name and hope that that would be an indication. Um, and sometimes we talked about my son or my daughter. Um, and we never even thought that possibly uh, as they grow up, they might change their mind about being a son or a daughter. Um, gender is not set in, in cement and it can change over time, but I'll tell you a bit more about that shortly. So different from very early on, I was a very different kid to my sisters or my brother, although my brother is also on the spectrum. Um, he was nine before, before I was born, so, so or when I was born, so I didn't really get to know him that well. He'd left home before I'd um, gotten very old. So but anyway, usually, frequently, traditionally, we understand gender as set. We look at the physical appearance and we make a judgment that person's male or female which of course we now know is not the case. Stories from autistic individuals tell us otherwise. Some people are not binary, they're not bound to that physical gender. Um, some feel much more female or much more male or some days of the week female, other days of the week male. And some are just a cross between the two. And in, in, in old terminology, we possibly would have thought of them as androgynous, um, but that's another story. So very, very different. So just like everybody else, we grow up and change over time, but our connection to our gender identity actually will too. So as autistic people, we have a different sensory system. Uh, I should put it, a little bit differently. We have a sensory system that senses things like anybody else. We see things, smell things, hear things, taste things, and so on. But um, our sensory system is governed by the way our brain is arranged, if you like. So because our brain is, is programmed, put together to be quite single focused, um, that's going to impact on our sensory system too. So our senses are going to be quite heightened or underdeveloped, if you like, and very often we move between the two. So things we see can seem too bright. Things we hear can seem too loud. Tastes in our mouth can feel really quite strongly in one way or another and, can, and certain tastes and certain feelings of food and things we can feel uncomfortable with. Um, etc. That's the external senses. And for a very long time when I was growing up, some of the discord or the um, discomfort I felt with some of my senses or information from those senses, I put down to my autism. It took me a long time to recognize the difference between a sensory overwhelming from um, a natural nor sort of normal outside stuff to what was actually overwhelming from my inside stuff. So the inner sensory system is called our interoception system. And that's, that's the system that lets us know about internal things, like if you're too hot or cold, uh, hungry or thirsty, you need the loo, um, if you're in pain, um, if you're anxious, and that there's a process of noticing our, our tummies are uncomfortable and things like that. So when I couldn't touch or bear anybody else anywhere near my, my breasts at that time or chest, I thought that was a sensory thing because I don't cope with people um, close to, with the sound close to my ears, that's very uncomfortable. People eating can make me feel quite uncomfortable. Um, and I couldn't tell anybody for a very long time. But in fact, that sense of not wanting anyone to touch this part of me was a gender thing. And I didn't discover that until I was talking to other people who were transgender, who changed their gender from the one they were born with or assigned at birth. They're born with the same gender. I'm, I was born male, but I wasn't assigned male. I was assigned female because they made a, a, um, a decision when they saw my genitalia. This, is, this person has a vagina, they're a girl. And our physiological sex may differ from our gender identity. And I'll explain a bit more about that. And there's a web page there 
to look these things up on, if you wish. Now, when we come into the world, we're a bit of a blank page, if you like. It's only as people get to know us and we get to know ourselves that things can change. But you know, especially true for females, I think, males do this as well, but especially true for a lot of females, they, they are born with double X chromosome. Uh, males usually have XY, women usually have double X, it's not always the case. And on the tip of that X chromosome, there's a, it's, there's, it, we're coded for sociability. So females are born with a double dose or a double ability, if you like, to notice socially. And the guys only have one X. I know it explains everything, right? Um, so women have two, and this means they have an added advantage even as autistic females, an added advantage of being able to watch what other people do, learn and copy. They learn over time quite often what will keep them safe, what will um, help them blend in, what will guide them through a situation so they don't get into trouble. So this is called, well, I call it adaptive morphing. A lot of people call it masking or camouflage. So that's going to give a covering of sorts where people won't see the real you they won't see the real you they'll see the mask that you present to them now this will mean for a lot of people a, a diagnosis or a, a recognition of autism will come later in life and it might be after many misdiagnoses after treatment for things you don't really have um, um mental health stuff bipolar, anxiety disorders. Now, don't get me wrong, things can co-occur. You can be autistic and have depression. You can be autistic and bipolar. You can be autistic and OCD. These things, uh, having an aspect in one direction doesn't mean you won't get anything else. But because it's not seen, people do not see the real you, that also means that the risk of mental health issues like depression is much higher. And if you're disconnected from your true sense of gender, that will be even higher. It's very high amongst autistic and gender questioning individuals. There's another web page there for you to, to look up. Um, if you've ever watched Dr. Mosley on his, he does a program, does lots of programs, but there's one about the, 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 the magic of you, of, of, of a baby and developing and, it's fabulous. I I'll, I'll can send the link to Mel afterwards. In, in episode two of that series, he talks about a baby developing their sense of gender identity and what can happen. And he says that around eight weeks, uh, the, the fetus in utero, in the uterus that's developing, is subject to a particular hormonal wash. Now, they've got, we've got these little buds within us that can become either testes, penis, um, vagina, ovaries, uterus. They look identical when you're very young as a, a little eight-week-old fetus. Um, but that hormonal wash, usually in sync with your chromosomes, double X for girl, XY for male, usually, um, will trigger that your body to, to grow and develop in a particular way. Double X becomes the girl, XY becomes the male. Now, that's only physically, physiologically, your outer body and your inner, your physical self. Later, at about 14 or 15 weeks, there's another hormonal wash that actually orchestrates your brain and your nervous system. And this is where gender is formed. It's in that system, not in your physical one, not in your reproductive system, but it's a brain sense of who you are. And sometimes, for some of us, that um, 15, 14, 15 week to that eight week period of hormones are not in sync. So you can get, you can get a hormonal sync that usually goes with being male, given across a female disposition or female physical body, or you can get the other that's usually given for males, um, and you're not male, at least your physical body isn't. I've probably said that wrong, but you get what I mean. I'm just a minute, I just get a bit of reassurance from him here. Oh, thank you very much. 
he says it's all right. So um, if that happens, then you'll get a dysphoria, a split between your gender identity and your physical identity. And that's what we know as gender dysphoria. So that means you're gonna grow up in one way, female or male, but your gender identity is gonna feel the opposite to who you were assigned to be at birth. This is important because this is happening much more often in autism in the autistic population as compared to the allistic non-autistic population. So for me, after my diagnosis, after recognition, don't really like the word diagnosis, but it's still seen as a sort of a medical thing. Um, whereas I feel that autism is a disposition that's beyond medical, it's more psychosocial, it's such a wider thing than a medical thing. But anyway, once I understood that I was autistic, I also understood the reason for a lifetime of social and academic difficulty. And the relief, the relief was huge. I now know there are reasons and ways that enable me to learn the way I do, which are better than some of the others. For example, you probably have heard that a lot of autistic people are visual learners. Um, I'm not actually a visual learner. I'm more an auditory learner. So that means I learn more by not what, by what, what I see, but what I hear. And I, I remember um, lots and lots of um, words and phrases and things that I've, I've, I've learned from television, from books and things like this. Um, and I'm fortunate that I do have accompanying visual images. Um, there are people who, who do not have that ability. They can't actually conjure up an image in their mind of something they've just seen. Uh, that's not a possibility for them, which makes that sense of connection to self and other even harder. Um, but it's important to understand this because however we're going to learn, a person or persons need to understand, this is my learning style. If they don't understand, they might try and teach me visually you know, as a kid, I would have torn the pictures up, taken them off the walls because they, they were in the way of my learning. Um, I need to, to listen, not look. So trying to make me give eye contact was very, very uncomfortable. So it's important to understand this because we want to build connection to self and to other people, whatever our gender. Um, and if we don't understand it, we might mess it up. So I still needed to understand my sensory system and my gender status because I lumped it all together under uh, the heading of, oh, this is autism. Oh, these are sensory issues. And I didn't understand that they were in fact different, that there are some gender issues for me that have been going on for many, many years. It took me a long time to join the dots. I never liked wearing bras, nothing new, lots of females don't. Um, I didn't like dresses. They bound against my legs that caused me discomfort. Um, I was allowed to wear boys' clothes, even at school. I was allowed to wear jeans because of a physical disability I had. I wore um, leg irons when I was younger, the calipers, they're called. And I needed my jeans over the top to help protect uh, a, a, my leg that was quite slim from a particular disease that I, I, I had when I was younger. Um, so anyway, where am I saying? So I still needed to understand the differences. I was different forever. It's not like this suddenly entered my life. This ever since I can remember, I felt different. I grew up as a tomboy. They kept calling me a tomboy. And I remember thinking, why not Jeff or John boy? Nothing to do with the Waltons, of course, but why? And, and there is a reason for Tom, but I can't go into it now because it's take up too much time from our session that we're supposed to be having. But I, it was normal for me to feel quite male um, I would practice lowering my voice, walking like a guy, peeing, standing up. Now, if you don't have the right um, uh, mechanics for that, <laughs> uh, it can be a pr pretty messy business. Um, the penis usually points away from your body, so you can usually pee, although it isn't easy to aim. I can tell you this from experience now. Um, but that was difficult and different because I was, in fact, living with a female body. I denied female puberty. So I got my first period uh, as a 10 year old. And I remember being told to, to go home because I had blood on the outside of my clothes and uh, I, I didn't recognize it, I just ignored it. 
and I tried really hard to keep my chest as flat looking as possible. Yes, over time, I didn't keep on ignoring it. I had to do something about it. And I did put pads inside my undies, just in case you were worried about that. But, you know, there are girls that I know of who do not want to grow up and become women, not because they're not female gender. They don't want to be or they don't have a concept for being an adult. Don't understand that. So they do things like limit their food intake, thinking that that will keep them. Um, I'll stay a child if I don't eat properly. I don't even know if they always absolutely understand what it is they're doing. So you can't actually put off growing up and you don't need to. We just need to be sure that we have support to take us through those years of going through puberty, which is pretty scary, pretty scary. And um, sometimes it's very hard to try and navigate on our own. If you don't have a concept for what this means, then we need somebody to help explain all that and tell us that it'll be okay, we will be okay. So here I am as a 13 year old, I think my apparent anatomical gender um, and my personality and my autism absolutely made me very vulnerable. Being very social, but not getting the understanding of the, of the rules of social interaction, certainly not recognizing when someone is being a friend, a trustworthy friend, when somebody is just wanting to abuse you, I couldn't tell the difference. And a lot of our kids won't be able to either. I was lively, outgoing, independent, keen to learn. Great, but I was also gullible, vulnerable, go off with anyone, totally unaware of danger. And when I was young, um, nobody really noticed whether I came home from school or not. And we had a, a local camp of travelers um, just outside the town. And I used to ride my bicycle and spend days with them, sitting around campfires, singing songs, riding the pony. They had a black and white purple pony, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, the little girl, Jenny, that I played with, used to ride my bike and I'd ride her pony. So nobody missed me. But this has a downside to it. The people at the, the traveler park were amazing. They were very trustworthy, beautiful people. And if I ever met them today, probably never will these days. They're in England and I'm in Australia. But um, they saved my life in more ways than one. But unfortunately, there were other people outside my family who were not so trustworthy. And yet I, I was sexually abused. Um, and that went on for many, many years. And I didn't understand the difference or the, what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. And I was talking to um, my counselor recently and saying, you know, I still feel a sense of guilt and shame about what happened to me. And he said, you know, when, when we're getting consent for a research project, if a person is underage, we get the parents' consent because children are deemed as not being old enough to give consent. You did not consent. You did not consent to what happened to you. And it was a really nice feeling inside me as I realized I'm not guilty because I was a child. I was certainly very young for my age, at the age of um, 10, 11, 12. It, I was more like a seven or an eight year old, very, very delayed in my, um, both in my development and in my cognitive and social understanding. Certainly poor at reading. I didn't really catch on to reading until I was about 13. Loved poetry and used to speak in rhyme all the time, which would get me into trouble because people thought I was doing it on purpose. It was quite natural for me. But one of the things I loved was acting and lots of games behind a, a big box with puppets, puppet shows that I used to entertain my sisters and the local kids with. And the beautiful thing about that was that it, it gave me a script for a story that enabled me to build all sorts of connections that I couldn't do outside of the puppets. And if that's what you have to do to help young people growing up understand, we need to work with where a young person's passion is to build those connections for them. I grew to feel at home in quite studious activities um, to the surprise of my family who didn't, didn't think I would ever amount to anything really. I was always in the special class, the special school kids, um, special needs kids, because I, I was deemed as being um, educationally subnormal. I remember the term intellectually disabled, which um, I'm not, 
but it can appear that way. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because we are all people who are complete, not just bits and pieces of something. Our gender is all of us. Um, and we need to find out ways to relate, share, teach, and educate the young people that we're supporting. I was told lots about the things I couldn't do. And again, there's such an emphasis on things we can't do, which, which hurts me because there is so much we can do. I was told I couldn't learn, but I did. I wasn't expected to finish school. I did. I might have been 38 when I went back to do year 11 and 12, but I got there. At 41, I started university, and at 57, I completed a PhD. I have a wife, a family, and a few friends, and most of my friends I actually consider family. Um, sometimes the families that we're born into are not very uh, accepting of who we are, and that can be difficult. And if that's the case for you, it's better to find other people to relate to you who can be your adopted family and who can be uh, what you need to support you as you grow up um, and travel through whatever it is that's happening for you. I'm very good at detail. I get lost in the detail. Um, so that again uh, points to that issue of not seeing the bigger picture. Discovering who I am can take a lot longer for all of us as autistic people um, because we're more detailed focused, especially on things we enjoy and love and less um, connected to that bigger picture. So my autism helps me focus on things that interest me, such as researching, writing, and poetry, but it also meant I often couldn't connect to the wider picture of self and of other. This is not a chosen thing. This is a part of me having the brain that I have, my autistic brain, which works with things one at a time and doesn't necessarily connect me to, to, to those other things that are part of the same picture. Um, that I need connections to so that I can navigate them. Uh, autism, sensory or gender issues, and I've touched on this a little bit, sensory connections absolutely impact gender. Um, I don't feel like the gender I'm told I am, but I didn't know what a woman or a female should feel like. And, you know, you're not allowed to go up and touch one and um, see what they feel like because we're talking about, well, you can touch your mum probably or your sister, on their arm, that's probably all right, but um, we're talking about an internal feeling, which you can't get to, I couldn't get to. What is, is it? Why am I so uncomfortable? Um, gender is a big part of my identity. Um, what is it that I can't connect to? Gender questioning is really common in the autistic spectrum. For us as autistic people, very common. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not, I'm not a boy or girl or a man or a woman, I'm me. I'm me, and they don't see any need to go beyond that, and that's fine, that's fine. But the me that I was connected to, I didn't feel at home with. I invented a middle uh, gender, if you like. I talked about middle sex, um, um, and in fact, we know that there's probably as many genders as there are stars in the sky, um, but no, there was no place the middle sex uh, it still didn't really help because um it, it i couldn't look that up anywhere i couldn't see any role models i couldn't couldn't put a, a wider name or understanding to it so i got i took a while to notice my thinking feelings and comfort gender wise were not because of autism but because i had gender dysphoria it took many many years i was 62 years old before i began to notice that this is what was happening for me so I met a boy uh, and we got married. Um, uh, this is interesting because somehow inside or with him and he, what he had a beautiful motorbike, matchless, very old English bike that he built up from a 250 to a 500 cc bike. It was a lovely bike. And somehow for me, the detail of him and the bike were one. And uh, Sad to say, I think I loved my I loved his bike probably more than I did him. But anyway, we went everywhere together. He was the person who took me to all the youth group meetings. And I remember the youth group leader saying to us one day, You two, you're like an old married couple. And I, I, I said to the pastor, We're not married. And he said, Well, you should be. So what do you do? You know, I'm very literal. 
I thought, okay, well, if he thinks we should be married, we better do this then. So we married, we had four kids, very easy to do. If you want to talk more about how that can happen, you can ask me afterwards, but very easy to do. Um, by the time my eldest was nearly 10, and Katie was nearly eight, Maddie was four, Tim wasn't quite two, a young lady called Beatrice came to stay at the house where we were. She was the au pair girl to the home. Um, we had rooms in somebody's house and um, she didn't speak any English, but you know, there was an immediate attraction between us and we didn't really understand it then. And she didn't have her diagnosis of autism then either. But um, Beatrice had a bigger impact on my life than certainly the father of these children. Um, well, I know this is really sad, and I always believed that uh, marriage was for life, and we had lots of problems in this relationship. This man was quite abusive at times, which I didn't understand. And um, I remember going to a counsellor and talking to this person, and she said to me quite clearly, and I've written about this, she said, Wendy, that was my name then, um, you stink. And I thought, oh, dear, it's not right to myself. And she said, you are carrying a dead relationship, a corpse of a relationship. And the only thing to do is to have a respectable funeral, which is called a divorce. Now, wow, until death do us part, and this relationship had died. So that, that released me um, uh, to pursue, um, as time went by, uh, the separation. From, from, from the father of these children and um, it enabled Beatrice and I to, to be able to form a, a relationship and live together. I've written about these things, so you, you can look those things up more in more detail in my books. For more, I felt much more male than female. I loved being a mum, but I felt wrong as a woman. Uncomfortable shopping for clothes, that women had to wear in women's shops or in, you know, in Target in the theme in where the women's bits were, came up where the women's bits were, very uncomfortable, um, much more drawn. In fact, I always bought men's clothes, men's jocks, uh, men's shirts and so on. Uncomfortable in public toilets, I was in the ladies' toilet waiting for someone to come up and say, hey, what are you doing in here? The men's is next door kind of thing. Very hard to explain. I certainly had no understanding of this internal um, wrestling that was going on within me. And we've had some fun times, Katie and I, my daughter, sitting in the back of the taxi, for example, and she's going, mum, mum, and the taxi driver's looking at us in the mirror, and I know he's quite confused, because <laughs> I don't look like a typical mum, if there is such a thing. I'm a man mum, but I'm still mum. Um, eventually, we did get divorced. Beatrice and I formed a partnership and we've now been living together and married uh, together for 37 years. But she couldn't emigrate to Australia for a long time. We had to get special visas and things. So she was 28 when she came to Australia. And because I was still living in that female form, we decided we must be gay. Now, sexuality is a very different thing to gender. They're very different things. Sexuality is that um, romantic expression um, if you like, and the gender is who you believe you are, and they're very different. I was very, very, very drawn to her. Um, I loved her, and so, okay, well, we must be gay. At that time, I was totally una unaware that I had any other choice, and um, that was really interesting. We got married um, when the laws allowed two same-sex people to marry. This was in the UK in 2007. I did ask for the ice wedding cake to be red and green. I, I loved colour and I wanted red and green, but they, they, they thought a wedding cake must be white with red and green decorations, I think. I was a bit disappointed, but the cake tasted good. So that was all right. That was all right. Um, she's gorgeous, hey? Yeah, I think so too. Anyway, concepts of normality. Uh, I've actually written a book called that. We form these beliefs based on familiarity. Human beings feel safe in what they experience as familiar. This then is mistakenly, mistakenly becomes what is normal. Um, if you ask somebody what their normal coffee was, you'd probably get 
you ask 20, 20 people, you might get 20 different answers. There isn't one normal way of having coffee or one normal way of having tea. There are many. Normal for you may not be normal for me. So this term normal is actually problematic, problematic. I now know my norm is in being male. So I took steps to conform my body. You can't change your brain at the moment. Conform my body so that it would be more what is the norm for me. For others, it might be usual for them to be non-binary. This is their norm. They're not male or female. They're not bound to any particular gender. Um, uh, gender non-conforming or at home with their cisgender, all, all are absolutely fine. But for autistic people, we can take a while to process this. And if people understand this, it's so, so good to have supportive others walking with us in this kind of a journey, especially with young people that are moving up to puberty and are asking all these questions about who they are. So trans, after 62 years and lots of life happenings, the death of one of my sons, that was the lad in the rusty colored jumper, moving house several times, returning to study, getting a PhD, being prominent in ex-gay leadership and church, which I have apologized for. Then being asked to leave church due to owning my love of a woman. Um, a long, long time before I began to recognize I was in fact trans, as in I'm a man in a woman's body. And the way to um, fix that, if you like, is for me to become the man that I am. So sharing that news, talking with my partner was really difficult. She was absolutely horrified. Beatrice is autistic. She doesn't like change. It was very difficult. Eventually, though, she agreed to support me and uh, be on the boat with me, as she put it. The first step, though, was to find out, well, who am I? What is my gender? So I saw a psychiatrist here in, in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, uh, he was a psychiatrist who came from the gender clinic, and this was his main, main job. But you see, he found it very uncomfortable because I'm autistic. And he was concerned this might just be a special interest. I remember saying, I'm 62 years old. I don't have to freeze my eggs or do anything. I've been there, done that. Not froze my eggs, but I've given birth to kids. I should be allowed, if this is my interest, I should be allowed to embark on this. But, you know, he would not, he would not release me to explore that any further. We had all these tests and he wondered if it might be to do with some other psychiatric situation. And for eight months, we met and talked and I put through these tests on pen and paper and asked these questions about this and about that. It was very uncomfortable. Toward the end of that eight month period, I went to the UK on a lecture tour and um, I saw another psychiatrist over there from a, a London gender clinic. He spent less than an hour and a half with me, an hour and 20 minutes, I think it was. And he said, there's no doubt in my mind when you are trans, you are a man, this is who you are. And the gender physically you were born into isn't the right one for you. And he said, the remedy, the prescription, the treatment is to transition out of that female role into the male role. Um, some people do that by changing their name on everything <laughs> um, and dressing more in the clothing they feel at home with, um, sort of a social transition, we call it. Others do social and medical. Uh, I wanted to be completely male in every possible way, which meant lots of surgery. This is very expensive, very emotionally taxing, um, very physically taxing, especially as I was an older person. But I tell you, I have not looked back once. From the minute he told me, there was this <sighs> relief and that knowledge, this is home for me. Um, as I said earlier, you don't know your home until you are. So that was amazing. And Beatrice had complete trust in this man. She felt really comfortable with him, the London guy, and respected his um, assessment. So seeing the psychiatrist getting assessed long and drawn out, getting hormones, for me, um, as a female, you live with estrogen and female hormones. 
And part of that transitioning into becoming the man that I am meant I had to have male hormones. So that um, that they they kind of insist or encourage you to live for a year or two um, without any kind of treatment as such, which is very difficult. I remember going into the barbers in St Kilda, the big breasted woman that I was, 96 kilos, sitting down, and he said, "This is men only." I said, "Oh, good, because I'm a man." And he said, "Suit yourself." <laughs> didn't physically look male but inside and in my gender I was eventually hormones changed and lowered my voice eventually I was able to have surgery to take boobs away and change my body and conform it to uh, to that of a, a masculine body so that took it was a long process over five or six years and this transition only began seven years ago so it's you know I'm only just at the tail end of puberty really just so I tell you that. So gender dysphoria, GD, and the incidence in autism is very high. The studies to date show gender dysphoria is more likely to impact autistic individuals than those in the non-autistic population. And there's a, another web page you can look up, but we need to understand and be prepared with the right support. And if you're not in any way unhappy with your gender, as a female or as a male, the gender you were assigned at birth, this is who you were born to be. We're still, as autistic people, are going to need to understand what that means for us. Remember that earlier on in this talk, I talked about masking and um, copying and not really being quite at home and knowing who we are. It's far too common in the autistic population. And we need support sometimes to unravel who we actually are. Research is showing up to 40% of autistic individuals live with gender variants gender dysphoria and this population is incredibly vulnerable. I know that this is a difficult topic but being difficult only means we need to be more supportive not less, not judgmental, listening to what autistic kids and teens and older people are saying. We want them, we want them to have a future, we want them to have a future. Now, I, um, Sam is writing a position paper for reframing autism and he sent it to me uh, to check out some quotes so I I put this piece on the slide because I thought it's so important now I say LGBTQIA plus Sam had written it I think TIQA so there's both versions on here but this is how I say it so a recent survey of LGBTQIA plus the Q is for queer L is for lesbian, G is for gay, B bisexual, T trans, I is for, I thought you were going to tell me, intersex, and that's again something we don't talk enough about, so there are parts of me that um, have been shown to have um, aspects of both male and female within my anatomy, um, and it, it's not as unusual as people think. But we need to talk about that more. And A is for asexual. There are lots of autistic people who are not sexually inclined. They need their hugs. They need to be loved. But they're really not into sexual intercourse, interaction. Um, and you can look these terms up. But this is much more common. That whole label that I've just described is much more common. Australian youth found that one in eight neurodivergent and LGBTQIA plus young people reported a suicide attempt in the last year. In the last year, more than one in three reported a suicide attempt in their lifetime. I'd attempted suicide three times in my life. And as you can see, I wasn't successful. I wasn't very pleased at the time, but I'm very happy that, that, that I wasn't successful. But I understand what can push somebody to feel incredible despair. Um, the rate is more than twice as high in LGBTQIA plus young people without a disability, and five times as high as the same age group who are neither LGBTQIA plus nor disabled. And you can look that all up. Now that's incredibly high, incredibly high. Um, you don't come back from this. Once you actually succeed with suicide, that's the end. There's no second chance. And we need to be in relationship with our young people, whatever their gender, uh, whatever their sexuality. We need to be in a relationship that says, I love you, I support you, I'm walking with you. 
Um, otherwise, we risk losing our child. We risk losing our child. You know, I love what Michelle is doing at the Children's Hospital, the doctor there, who um, and, um, talks about things like puberty blockers. The thing about puberty blockers, when you're not sure what gender you are meant to be, is that it gives everybody time and it does no harm. So this is what's important. It gives everybody time and it does no harm. Some people have said to me, yes, but it means if you delay puberty, you're putting a greater distance between um, this person and their peers. This uh, 12, 13, 14 year old might be like 16 and they're still 14 as in their development. Do you know, that's the least important thing in this whole scenario. This is so strong, an incredibly strong thing that um, puberty blockers by time to sort everything out, to help us know what is sensory, what is gender, what is personality, um, what is learning style and so on. It's so, so important. I cannot stress how important this is. So please, if this is where you're at, um, you, you talk to somebody who knows about it, feel reassured, um, travel on this journey with us. Over 40% of trans individuals living with GD attempt suicide. It might even be higher than that. And you can look up um, more information about this on this webpage. Now, I'm aware that I'm not physically at a conference for you to ask questions, but I hope that somehow if you need to ask questions, Mel can convey those to me or the right person uh, to be able to answer them. These are some resources. My webpage is at the top, www.lawson, when Lawson, sorry, Dot com is one of them. I've got a YouTube um, channel. I've got um, Facebook. Uh, Yen and I have written a book called The Autistic Trans Guide to Life that touches on lots of the things that I've been talking about and more. Um, my wife and I, Beatrice and I, have also written a book on transitioning together. Just one couple story of gender and identity discovery as autistic people. Um, women and girls on the spectrum, a profile. That's um, a page that you can look up. And Booktopia has a great book on gender identity, sexuality, and autism as well. And those are all readily available for you to, um, to look up and find. So that's the end for me.